And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question, and if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Um, now the question that we're addressing this morning is really very straightforward um, because it comes straight out of the passage. Um, look at verse 23 again. Um, they came up to him, the chief priests and the elders of the people, and while he was teaching, and they said to Jesus, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Our question this morning is what gives Jesus the right? Now, you might think that is actually quite a good question, isn't it? Um, certainly, it's a good question when you think about the way in which Jesus turns individual lives upside down. Um, if you were to become a Christian, um, it would turn your life upside down. What gives Jesus the right? I remember speaking to a friend a few years ago and they had decided as they were investigating the Lord Jesus that they found Jesus quite attractive as a personality and they thought that the evidence for him was probably true. Um, they, they actually wanted what Jesus offered and they were sort of pro-forgiveness and, and wanted life. But the thing that stuck for them was the idea of recognizing him as an authority. And that, that felt wrong to, to put your life under the rule of somebody else, especially somebody who seems so remote from you, um, to surrender to somebody that you've met through the pages of a book. What gives Jesus the right? It's a good question, isn't it? We live in the age of the self and um, our number one duty to ourselves and to society, we're told, is to be our authentic self. And politically, I don't know whether you um, are on the left or on the right, um, although I know which of you would be happier um, uh, this Sunday. Um, but whether you're on the left or on the right, uh, the truth is that you probably all think that liberty is a good idea. Um, none of us are sort of pro-slavery as a political position. And then Jesus is a king who claims the right to turn our lives upside down. And there are places in the world where to speak of Jesus as a king is borderline incomprehensible. I mean, what does that even mean? And he is a king who makes the most extraordinary demands, isn't he? And his very first words in public in Matthew's gospel were, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change your mind. It's so bossy, isn't it? And the next words that he speaks are, follow me. And then just in case you weren't sure what that means, in Matthew chapter 16, we're told, if anybody would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And of course, that's enormously disruptive. It disrupts families, it disrupts whole lifestyles. And you might ask the question, what gives Jesus the right? Of course, you can ask the same question on a more global level because Jesus has turned the world upside down. On the one hand, as we were beginning to think about last week, he's put an end to a 1,000 year history of the project of God's um, plans and purposes centering on Jerusalem. Um, you might say that he redrew the spiritual map of the world. So imagine that all of the publishers um, in the UK no longer created maps where the center of the map was the Greenwich Meridian. And imagine instead that they suddenly made the center of the world Madagascar or the Seychelles or Papua New Guinea. Well, that's what Jesus did. He overthrew a thousand year tradition of Jerusalem as the center of the world. And then positively, he launched a movement that would destabilize and topple societies, regimes, dictators, empires the world over, has done for centuries and will continue to do so. And again, you might justifiably ask the question, what gives Jesus the right 
to do such a thing. Um, In our passage in Matthew, the immediate issue is what Jesus has just done in the temple. We saw last week that when Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, the center of God's purposes, when he arrived at the house, the, the meeting place of heaven and earth, that what he did as soon as he arrived there was to turn over the tables to drive out the, the money senders and the, and the pigeons um, and then to curse the fig tree. And you'll remember if you were here last week that we said that that was not just an act of cleansing or purifying the temple, making it fit for purpose again, that what he was actually doing was judging it and putting it to a stop. And maybe this illustration will help you. Imagine that instead of going to the temple, Jesus had gone to St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, What we're saying is that what he did when he arrived there wasn't that he chased out the tourists, smashed a few cameras and shut the gift shop. It's that he chased out the choristers, defrocked the clergy and slammed the doors. That's what he did. And so unsurprisingly, verse 23 When he entered the temple again the next day, he went back. The chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? I mean, it's important to see that they're not just harumphing. I mean, they probably were harumphing, but they're not just harumphing here, albeit in the wrong tone of voice, um, albeit with no interest in the actual answer, They are, in fact, asking exactly the right question. Uh, Matthew 21, verse 23 through to 22, verse um, 46, is bookended by answers to this question about the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. What gives you the right? And, of course, the trouble is that Jesus answered it in a slightly evasive way. In verse 24, Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. It looks like Jesus is being evasive, doesn't it? Um, Like a a deflection, um, a refusal to answer. And so I think it's important for us this morning, before we think harder about what Jesus is saying about the religious leaders and what Matthew wants to show us about them, I think it's important that we begin by realizing that Jesus does actually answer um, the question and that Jesus does tell us by what authority he does the things that he's doing. And so firstly, this morning, an encouragement for disciples. And Jesus has all the authority of heaven. Verse 23 again, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, From where did it come? From heaven or from man? And now that is an answer to the question that they've asked. Uh, But to understand how it's an answer, uh, you have to know two things, uh, both of which we know um, as people who have been reading Matthew's gospel. Um, The first is that there is a correct answer to Jesus' question. The baptism of John, where did it come from? From heaven or from man? Matthew um, and the Lord Jesus have been really clear about this. John the Baptist was a God-commissioned prophet. Uh, When the religious leaders say in a couple of verses, and the crowd all hold that John is a prophet, that's not the opinion of some northern yokels. Well, it's not just the opinion of some northern yokels. Um, It is the correct answer. John was, in fact, a prophet. Um, Back in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus talks about John the Baptist. Um, John Matthew chapter 11 and verse 9, and he asked the question, when you went out to the wilderness to see John the Baptist, what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I say to you, among all those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. See, there's a right answer to the question. What does Jesus think of John the Baptist? Well, he thinks he's not just a prophet. He is, in fact, the ultimate prophet, the messenger sent before the Lord's face. In fact, he can say he is the greatest of all of those born of women, which is quite something to say. There's a correct answer to his question. 
Um, and so when he asked the question, John's baptism, which is a way of talking about his ministry as a whole, did it come from heaven or from man? Uh, the answer is heaven. That's the first thing he needs to be clear on. The second thing we need to know is that John pointed to Jesus. Again, if you read the gospel, you see this. Actually, we did just hear it, didn't we? We, we read from Matthew chapter 3 for our first reading, and, and we went back to that moment when John the Baptist met Jesus. And we heard John's message, how John the Baptist considered himself to be preparing the way for someone who was greater than him. And he said, after me will come somebody who will baptize not with water, but with the Holy Spirit and with fire. In fact, the one who's coming after me is so much greater than me that I'm not even worthy to bow down and to untie the thongs of his sandals. And then Jesus came to him, and John the Baptist acknowledged that this was the one that he was talking about. And just in case you missed it, heaven itself opened, and the Holy Spirit descended as a dove, and God the Father boomed from heaven. This is my son whom I love. See, John the Baptist didn't leave any doubt. Um, he said that Jesus was greater than he. Um, the heaven sent, spirit baptizer, fire baptizer, who was so much greater than the greatest born of women that John wasn't even worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. And so when Jesus asks this question, he's not asking some sort of imponderable. You know, if you were to sort of represent the meaning of life as a number, uh, what number would you pick? Uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Now, you've asked me, if I also will ask you a question. It's not some imponderable. And there's a very clear answer to the question that Jesus asks, an immediate one, from heaven. Well, there you go. And they, you know everything you need to know. Heaven sent John, and so heaven itself has told you where my authority um, has come from. But Jesus has all the authority of heaven. And this is an important point, um, actually. It's an important point here in this paragraph. That word authority comes up four times in this exchange. But actually, it's an important point in the whole of Matthew's gospel, isn't it? And if you've read through Matthew to the end, you'll know that this is exactly the question that Matthew lands on at the end. Um, so where does it get to, the punchline of Matthew's gospel? Jesus says, all authority, actually echoing the words of the question, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And that's where Matthew wants to get us, to see that Jesus has been given all authority um, by heaven, uh, by God. And it really matters. It matters because it's hard to say how seismic the shock was of what happened um, last week. Um, when, when Jesus went into the temple um, and said that he was going to judge it and replace it with something else, and that ought to stun us. Uh, just a moment ago, I compared it with going to St. Paul's Cathedral um, and shutting down St. Paul's Cathedral. But the truth is, it is nothing like that. It's nothing like it. Because the temple was a building that had been directly planned, commissioned, and designed by God. Uh, not one of the church buildings that people meet in in this country can claim that, not even this one. Uh, none of them have been directly planned, designed, and commissioned by God. St. Paul's, I'm so sorry to say this, it's essentially man-made, um, as in it was commissioned by men, it was designed by a man, we know his name, it was Christopher, um, it was built by men. I mean, sure, men with good motives, and he wanted to do something to honor God. But it was designed, commissioned, and built by men. And so to shut down St. Paul's Cathedral would be, well, it's comparative small fry in comparison to what Jesus did by striding into the temple in Jerusalem and symbolically shutting down that house. And think of the authority figures that you might think of from the Old Testament. Um, so who might you pick? The great authorities uh, priests, um, above the priests, kings, above the kings, prophets. Uh, prophets, priests, and kings. Which of those three would have the right to shut down the temple in Jerusalem? Answer, none of them. There is only one person in heaven and earth who has the right to close the temple, God's house, in Jerusalem. 
and it is the Lord himself. It's really important, isn't it? It's really important we understand this. Jesus could only do that because he had all of the authority of heaven. He was right to shut the temple and replace it with something else because he had all the authority. He has all the authority of heaven. And so hopefully that encourages you if you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus, and particularly if you're a bit surprised by what he did last week. And But of course, the primary audience here in this paragraph um, is not disciples. Um, Jesus is speaking to his opponents. And so our second point this morning, um, a rebuke to the religious leaders, and perhaps you could put this in inverted commas, um, your opposition to his authority is duplicitous and self-serving. Uh, verse 23, and when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And the way that Matthew's put that actually should remind us of last week, that last week the lame and the blind came up to Jesus in the temple and beautifully they received healing and sight as he did wonderful things. Well, here's another group coming up to Jesus the next day. And they come with anger in their eyes. By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. Now, I've spent a little while trying to show you that Jesus isn't really being evasive, um, as in he does actually answer their question. Um, if they were willing to follow the line of reasoning, they would understand by what authority he does these things. But of course, it is worth thinking about why he answers their question with a question at all. And why doesn't he just tell them? Um, the evangelist Randy Newman has written a book called Questioning Evangelism. Um, I don't think he's questioning evangelism. I think he believes in evangelism that asks questions. That's the, the point of the book. Um, and his suggestion is that Jesus asked a lot of questions in the Gospels, which is true, um, and that maybe we would do quite well to ask a few more questions when we're talking to people about the Lord Jesus. And he points out that there are various reasons why questions can be a very powerful tool. Um, and one reason why questions can be a powerful tool, not the only one, but one reason is because they expose um, they expose those questioners who are uninterested in the truth. You know, they come and they pretend to ask a question. And if you answer them, then you're the one who looks silly. But actually, they're not interested in truth. And so just ask them a question back, and that all becomes clear. And of course, that is exactly what's happening here. Verse 24, Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. From where did it come, from heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. It's a priceless scene, isn't it? You can completely imagine it being played out again today. Um, can't you? In fact, you don't really have to imagine, you just have to think back to the Scottish Parliament about sort of nine months ago. Um, and so here's Nicola Sturgeon, the Scottish First Minister, and she's trying to introduce her kind of controversial gender recognition bill into Scottish law. Um, and, and, and at the same time, there's this controversy about the fact that there are um, one or two prisoners in Scottish prisons um, who are uh, in prison for rape um, and are being um, uh, are, are now identifying as transgender women and asking to be transferred to women's prisons. And do you remember that whole thing and that happened nine months ago? Um, and, and do you remember the, the joy of the journalists who asked her this question? Are you saying that a transgender woman who is in prison for rape is not a woman? And you could see the cogs turning, couldn't you? If I say yes, the entire philosophical basis of my gender recognition bill collapses. But if I say no, the electorate will understandably crucify me. What will I say? And so she mumbles, I don't know. <laughs> of course, what makes Jesus' question here so brilliant is not just that he catches his opponents on the horns of a dilemma, 
it is that he exposes the utter cowardice and the self-service of his questioners. Verse 25 again. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. And so they answered Jesus, we do not know. So striking, isn't it? They are not interested in the right answer. Now, they claim to be the authorities in the temple. They, they claim to be the leaders of the people before God. But they don't care about the authority of heaven. And all they care about is the optics. Um, they, they, they want to think about how they look to the public. They want to hang on to their position. And so they say, I don't know. And my friend, um, Andrew Satch, who used to be on the staff here, um, has written a little book um, with a nice little title, Are You 100% Sure um, That You Want to Be an Agnostic? You can go and think about that if you like. Are you 100% sure that you want to be an agnostic? And he points out in the book that saying, I don't know, um, I'm an agnostic, well, it's not always an honest answer, is it? And it's not always humble. And sometimes you say, I don't know, because you don't want the answer and because you're not interested in the answer. Um, I've been quite struck by this passage, actually, as I've thought about it. Um, I've thought about myself and I've thought that actually it's possible for us to be much, much too worried about what people will make of our words. And sometimes I would do much better to worry about whether what I am saying is true than whether I will get away with it and when someone asks me the question. And we should not be using our words to hide what we really think. But of course, the point is um, that Jesus um, has shown up their challenge for what it really is. They think that they are the authorities. They think that they are the gatekeepers. But the truth is that they are duplicitous, pretending not to be able to answer questions that they can. The truth is that they are cowardly, afraid of the very people that they think that they rule. The truth is that they are thoroughly secular. They are uninterested in heaven and uninterested in heaven's authority, only man. And the truth is that they are self-seeking. And Jesus rebukes, and the religious leaders, your opposition to his authority is duplicitously self-serving. Of course, it's worth saying here that not everybody who has questions about the authority of the Lord Jesus neatly fits um, into um, the place of these religious leaders. Um, uh, it, it may be that um, you have been thinking yourself about whether you'd like to become a Christian, um, and it may be that you have questions about whether Jesus really has all the authority that he claims that he does. And as, as we've already said, that is in fact the right question to be asking. It is right to ask whether Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. And Jesus has tremendous patience for anybody who asks honest questions in pursuit of honest answers. And if that is you, please keep asking your questions and please keep honestly seeking the truth. Jesus has tremendous patience for honest questions seeking answers. He has no patience for those who question his authority with no desire to submit to the truth. And so this is a rebuke. Um, for them, um, their challenge to his authority was duplicitously self-serving. And Matthew's purpose is that disciples of the Lord Jesus would not let this sort of opposition to Jesus deflect them from their heaven-authorized task of making disciples of the nations. It is possible, isn't it, that, that we would. It is possible that we might come to Jesus with a similar attitude to the religious leaders, um, uh, that we might challenge um, his authority. What gives you the right with no intention of listening to his answer? And of course, if that is us, we need to hear Jesus' rebuke. Are we interested in answering the question honestly, or have we already decided? 
it's possible that we will be intimidated by the, the, the power, those um, uh, in positions of power, um, and the power and the position of people who are opposed um, to Jesus' authority. And it's possible that we're intimidated by people who want to stop us from making disciples in his name. Uh, you can easily imagine, can't you, a government um, shutting Christian meetings down. Uh, you don't have a permit for that. Uh, you can easily imagine a police force interrupting Christian meetings and telling Christians that what they are doing is illegal. Now, of course, we need to be wise about how to handle the police and wise about how to handle governments. But if we are getting on with the work of making disciples, and if Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, and if it's at his say-so that we make disciples of the nations, then no government on earth has the authority to countermand that. It's possible that it's those who claim to lead God's people that will shut down disciple-making disciples of the Lord Jesus. And the chief priests and the uh, rulers of the people here crucified Jesus. And the next thing that they did was to arrest the disciples for seeking to make disciples of the nations. And Matthew wants us to see, I think God wants us to see, that their challenge does not stick. When Jesus shut down the temple and replaced it with his disciple-making people, he had all the authority of heaven and earth behind him. Of course he did. He was God. He is God. And the fact that they challenged his authority just exposed their lack of any meaningful authority of their own. Matthew's purpose is that disciples of the Lord Jesus would not let this sort of opposition to Jesus deflect us from our heaven-authorized task of making disciples of the nations. And that brings us to us. Um, here's a prediction for the students. In the coming years, it will be increasingly difficult to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus on campus. Uh, you will be told that campus is a secular space that you do not have the right to bring your Christian faith and especially your Christian values into a secular space. You may already have experienced that. And I think what you need to know is that you have all the authority of King Jesus, heaven and earth behind you, as you seek to make disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ on campus. And there is nobody on campus or anyone else who has the right to countermand that. If they do, it just shows them for the hollow authorities that they are. Here's a prediction for us as a church. In the coming months, we will be told um, that doing what we need to do to continue making disciples, training and selecting leaders, and commissioning them and sending them out to lead churches and to lead the Christian ministry is something that we cannot do that we must not do without the authorization of leaders who have set themselves against the authority of King Jesus. It's illegal what you're doing. And don't worry, it's happened before. When George Whitfield and John Wesley in the 18th century went to preach the gospel to people who weren't hearing it, they were told that they were acting illegally because they were preaching in other men's parishes. And, and do you know what? I don't think they really cared because they knew that the authority of the risen and ascended Lord Jesus Christ stood behind them. No um, Church of England authority in the 18th century had the right to countermand um, the command of the Lord Jesus, go and make disciples of all nations. It will happen again. And what we need to know, uh, what we need to be absolutely sure of, is that the only permission that we need to make disciples of the Lord Jesus and to do what it takes to go on making disciples of the Lord Jesus, we already have. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 23. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would spare us um, from the sort of duplicity and cowardice um, that claims to um, be an authority and serve you and yet challenges your son to his face like this. But more than that, we pray so much that you would embolden us with the authority of our King, the Lord Jesus. Please help us not to be deflected and from the great work of establishing his praise amongst the nations. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.